the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. I wish to say to you something <clears throat> that I heard recently. It was put rather well, and so I am going to I'm going to offer it to you to consider. A lot of times we don't think about what we say when we say Heavenly Father or Holy Father. Holy or Heavenly makes God so distinct and so remote from us as to be, as Martin Buber said, the thou and the I and thou, completely other. But when we say Father, now all of a sudden we are children and the distance collapses into perfect intimacy because we are flesh of his flesh in the sense that we are children, in the sense that we are Father. So Holy Father is a juxtaposition of two elements that are completely disperse. It's the same thing when we say God and mammon, or as I'm going to propose now to you, not in the sense of a duality as some philosophers have undertook, but just in the sense of a kind of emphasis, the mind and the spirit. The Jews sought light, the Hebrews, they sought light. The Greeks or the Gentiles, they sought knowledge. They sought knowledge. They wished to be wise. The Jews in the desert, they followed a pillar of light. And we, who have been grafted, as St. Paul says, into the vine, we have taken their place. We are seekers of light. But everything else in this world is aimed at the promotion of our wisdom. We do not marvel and say this man is enlightened. We say this man is a doctor. We do not say that this man is someone that we admire because he knows God, because who is God after all? We have a confusion about God in this world of ours. He may be called by a number of different names and who you call Jesus, Lord, Master, and God, someone else may call teacher, prophet, or avatar. So there is no consensus on this. So we have a very special relationship, and we are caught, we literally are caught between our spirit and its implications for us in our action in this world and for our mind. Because if we wish to succeed, we must purpose ourselves in an arena of competition that requires a great proportion of our time be spent learning the game and acquiring the skill of ratiocination or mentition, intellectual involvement in the pursuit of some identifying definition so that 
we can make sense of this life rather than pursuing just light. We have all kinds of medicines that are given to us prescriptively to overcome bad living rather than seeking right living and light and the purpose of our Creator we seek rather how to compromise and how to harmonize the things that everyone else does with our own spirituality and that puts us at cross purposes and that's why there is so much conflict in the church parents are conflicted when it comes time for exams they don't know whether to tell their kids to study hard or to go to church and to pray to Tzvah. When you see yourself as a young person and you're involved in athletics and the church tells you to fast, you think that perhaps you're going to be less virile, less manly, because you do not have the same kind of nutrient resource that others have available to them because they are not fasting. Famously for the Portland Trailblazers, Bill Walton, the center, famous for his exploits at UCLA and winning one world champion with them as center, he tried to be a vegetarian to not eat meat. It didn't work. His career was riddled with injuries. Now his son who plays for the Lakers, <laughs> he's a dedicated meat eater. Usually when you start to promote in your own life the values of the world, the first thing that you give up are the things of God. And then you feel guilt. And then you walk in a different way. The Lord Jesus Christ said it clearly, you cannot serve two masters. You have to decide. As much as I love her singing, sweetheart, <laughs> you, 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 let, let somebody else outside take care of her. Or... The the video stream you see you can access off the internet so you can catch this and, and bring it back in when the liturgy begins. And I have been told that we're going to have the microphone for the, the, the baby's room very shortly. So there won't be any further inconvenience. But think about the pursuit of light by the Hebrews rather than the pursuit of knowledge by the Greeks. We are in this world still. And what do we think about the people that walk not doing the same things that we do? Don't we think that their values are a little skewed? Don't we look at them with suspicion? And don't we find them to be just a little bit curious. Think about how we treat the Amish. I'm not talking about a, making an apology for their theological underpinnings of their activity, but just the activity itself. It is aimed at pleasing God. Whatever else you may say about the Amish, you may say that they try insofar as they are able to please God. They have a life that is very much different than ours. And there are other groups of people like that as well. And we regard them almost as people who have come from another planet. Yet if we have the fidelity and the faithfulness of these, think about the Jehovah's Witness who stands on the corner having to buy Watchtower magazines with his own money and then give them away to people. 
Think about the impingement upon his life and the insults that are hurled at him because he will not stand and make the Pledge of Allegiance in schools when he's young. He will not celebrate birthdays or other holidays, <clears throat> Christmas, Easter, or whatever. He will not pay any allegiance to anything other than God. And for this, just obeying what he feels is his, his calling, he's ridiculed. There is some of that in us, which is the fear of ridicule. And so we do not do all that we can do. Well, what happens to those people? What is going to happen to us? You know, I'm, I'm always curious when it comes to rules. I'm always curious about why people can, in their own mind, justify which rules they are going to obey and which rules they are going to discard. As though they had some philosophy which was not included by God because he was either not clear thinking or he didn't understand the way an individual was constituted or he didn't realize how tough things were going to be for us. So he made rules and then we have concluded which rules we are going to simply adhere to and those that we are going to despise and disregard. So then, what do we say about ourselves? We have no master at all. In the gospel today, the Lord said, you cannot serve God and mammon. Well, what about a group of people who serve neither God nor mammon? They're not pure in any of their instincts. They're conflicted and they are confused. And so they waffle or they vacillate like a wavy line moving up and down and up and down and up and down and you can not rightly we have chairs up here Elham there are plenty of chairs come on up here people who come in late like my wife they like to stand in the back come in here and everyone sit no there's plenty of room you don't want to sit Well, it troubles me. It troubles me as being one who has to bring these points up. But it's necessary, isn't it? It's too bad it's necessary. There's a kind of admiration in me that I have for crackpots. You know the people that, that do extraordinarily intense things. It doesn't matter whether they're right or wrong. I'm not talking about the end of them. I'm not talking about whether or not what they have done has value. Most of the time it doesn't, that's why they're called crackpots. But just the zeal with which they pursue something, I miss that kind of militating force in the life of an individual. There was a writer one time and he said about his friend that he burns with a hard, gym-like flame. Think about that a hard, gym-like flame, like a laser. And what can a laser do? What can a beam of light do? Well, it can cut through metal, can't it? A laser can etch a diamond, can't it? <clears throat> what could we do if we were like that light? What could we do if we didn't vacillate? What could we do if we didn't one day say, I'm for God, I'm for God, I'm for God, and the next day, oh man, the mortgages do, the mortgages do, the mortgages do. I've heard it said in my house so many times, well, I have to work really, really hard because I've got to bring in the paycheck. <laughs> and then, oh, it's, it, it's 
God. It's God that we live for. Well, what does the gospel say? That God has no has, has, has knowledge of what you have need of? That that he he takes care of the birds? And that you're of more value than many birds? That he at all times is covering those things that are required not those things perhaps that are desired but those things that are required so then why do we why do we worry as much as we worry about the consequence of events in our lives well there is some distress that's normal it's normal to all people because we are looking for success we're looking for the success of the people that we love. We're looking for the general welfare. And we're trying to provide a balance between our need for security and our desire for freedom. But at the same time, in the midst of all of these things, when we give ourselves over continuously to the pursuit of one at the loss of the other, we are making a decision about who it is we really belong to. Because if I apportion my time in such way that I don't have a very big slice of my life, think of the pie chart, left over for God or the other things that I really say are important, then I'm really not being honest with myself or looking clearly at what I portray. If I say this is me, then you should see that this is me by what I do. What I do should follow my espoused philosophy. What I do should be something that provides me with a clear and distinct identity so that other people can relate to me in a consistent manner the philosopher Goethe said that the fool and the wise man are equally harmless it's the half wise that are dangerous it's the person who vacillates you don't know whether you're gonna get him on the upside or on the downside you don't know if you're talking to them or you're talking to the fool or the brilliant person. When people start to go in too much of a vacillation, we call them what? Bipolar. And we give them medication to try to pull them in. But some of this is not because of a distorted brain chemistry. It's because of a distorted personality. It's because of a distorted focus. It's because we haven't yet decided who we belong to. Do I belong to the world, mammon? Do I belong to the Greeks? Do I belong to the mind? Or do I belong to heaven? Do I belong to holiness? Do I belong to God? Do I belong to the light? Whose am I? Well, this is that great journey of our church. This is the time, as I have said, that you should see your father of confession at least twice during these eight weeks. So that you have an opportunity to evaluate, to refocus, to get back on track, and to make clear that distorted image to focus and to bring in to great clarity your sense of purpose the idea that you have for yourself you know if you come to my house right now um, the, the, the last year of my life was given up almost entirely to ill health I was in the hospital three times in my 60th year of life I'm 60 so I've got about a month and a half in on my 61st year. <clears throat>
and I've been in a fury in my house about making my house neat, clean, uncluttered, organized. And there's some resistance in my house about this. Now think about why that would be. Think about why there would be resistance. Well, because in the year prior, I wasn't especially clean. I wasn't especially organized. I wasn't especially neat. I didn't worry about clutter. I didn't worry about anything. So maybe the people don't want to get involved with me in doing these things because they're not sure if I'm just going to flip back again. Could be. When I talk to you about something, I'm talking about chiefly myself. In other words, when I read the gospel, I first read it, I think about it, it comes out my mouth. It's a loop. I see it, I identify the words, and then it comes out here, and then I hear myself again. So I read it first, I pray it second, and then I hear it prayed. Because I hear my own words. And it's always for me, but I am the filter. So how I am feeling at the time, if I have a distorted personality, if I have a distorted spirit, if I myself am sick, it's going to be filtered. All of this is going to be filtered. And I may, in the midst of my sickness, not make you sick, but I may be talking about antidotes. I may be in the, in, the, in the midst of whatever is distorted in my own personality, be talking to you about my desire for clarity. So don't think that when I am saying anything to you at any time, I am not first saying these things to myself. I always am. And I say this periodically, because some people feel that when I'm looking at them as I'm saying something, I'm saying it just exactly to them. And I'm, I'm saying it generally. If I were writing, as many people have asked me, if I were writing, I would write in the same self-styled manner. Because after all, as I perceive Christ, as I receive him, my whole experience is the filter that then when I begin to share him, you see. That's why I, I have told Sunday school students and teachers alike that when they start to give to other people that they may find in life, their concept of God, as long as it is real, as long as it is authentic, then their speaking about God is going to be just just as effective as any great saint. It may not have the depth or the breadth, it may not have the texture, it may not have uh, the dynamic quality because it may be shallow, because they are shallow. They may be young in years. They may not have what the other person, in terms of capacity, experiences but if their relationship to the Lord is authentic then whatever it is that they have to say is going to be pure and true so when they meet somebody for the first time and start to talk to them they're speaking in a real way so I leave you with the last thought that we prayed and meditated on and I'm I'm, I'm certain you are meditating. I'm certain you always do when you hear what is said. I have never yet met somebody who was interested in God that didn't feel that the Bible was written just for him or for her. Never. A person who is genuinely caring about God He always feels that every single word in the Bible is just for him. So the last, so the last thing was, 
Seek first the kingdom. And then everything else you worry about will be added. Why? Because seeking the light first is not in inimical with seeking knowledge. But when you seek knowledge, sometimes all you get are the words of men and not the words of God. When you seek understanding, sometimes it's just the human level and it's not divine. So, I return to what I first said. The Hebrews, they sought light. The Greeks, they sought wisdom. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ, to those who had no belief, his apparent feebleness was a great stumbling block. Why didn't he come in power? Why didn't he come in the authority? Why did what happened to him, his crucifixion, his humiliation, his judgment, why? They could not wrap their mind about it. They could not, they could not understand. But those who have light, they can see the purpose of it. Those who have light will see the clarity of the action that is obscured and obfuscated by, by the apparent matter and look into the heart, into the secret things and see the love that permeates, to see the meaning of the sacrifice and to see the great gift that comes from above. So let us also, in like way, in the next seven weeks, seek this deeply in ourselves. Seek the light. Every one of you possesses it. But you can fan the flame. You can make it grow brighter. When the deacon, when the deacon puts the charcoal in the shuria, very, very quickly, a coating of ash covers it and not as much oxygen arrives. But as soon as the ash is moved from the top of the charcoal and air is gotten to it, it burns brightly, it glows. We can do that with ourselves. We can stoke the fire and we can fan the flame and then we can, as the poet said about his friend, we can burn with a gem-like hardness. May this gift be for all of you. Glory be to God forever.